Welcome back to our journey through 1 Corinthians. The church in Corinth uh, was quite an exciting place. It was a place, well the city itself was a place that was cosmopolitan. It was a place where things were exciting. It's a place where people came through as travellers and there were many, many interesting things that went on. And the people there were quite a bunch of people really, if you had known them. And um, when we get to chapter six, we will discover that there were people from all shapes and sizes. There were professionals, there were the actors, there were the immoral, um, kind of pleasure-seeking type of people that went well over the top as far as their morals were concerned. And there were all sorts and shapes and sizes. And God had saved people from that town. I was just reading this week in the book of Acts that God said to Paul, he was being persecuted for preaching in Corinth. He'd seen Jewish people saved and God said the message is for all the people, for all the nations, but I have many people in this city. And so Paul stayed there for 18 months preaching and teaching the word of God. Now as a result of that, he became a very much a father figure to them and also they oh, some of them became very uh, critical of him at certain stages which sadly is what happens the nearer you get to people the more you get to know them sometimes people then begin to become over familiar and familiar and critical i'm going to read you a couple of verses from chapter four that we've been dealing with Verse 6, the Apostle says, These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might in us that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Let's just leave it there for a moment or two. If we need to read more, we will do. Um, Paul has been dealing with the motives in the Christian's heart because he's being criticised by people as to why he did things and how he went about things. Uh, in verse 6, Paul is saying, I, I did actually use my name and Apollos' name. I transferred um, the kind of the storyline to us. I applied the things that I'm talking to you about to us specifically so that you might not, you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. In other words, what he's saying is the scripture teaches that we should be humble. And the scripture teaches that men should not think more highly of themselves than they ought to think, and that there should be no promotion of men. It should be promoting the Lord. It should be glorying the Lord. So he said, I used us rather than put down other people. I used Apollos and myself as examples. Now, Apollos, I was reading about him as well. In Acts 6, 18, he is a incredibly gifted man, a man who knew a lot of scripture, a man who knew a lot about the teaching of scripture, and he was eloquent and he could handle an argument and he could deal with specific details. He was a very gifted man. And so was Paul. Paul was a clever man, a logical man. You need to read the book of Romans to see that is the fact. Now he says, I transferred to us these principles so that you might learn from us not to actually think of one person above another and that you, no one of you, be puffed up for one against another. The idea here is he's saying, I don't want one of you to actually be puffed up in your pride in support of one against another. I want you to just see us the same, servants of God, servants who do the work of God and we learn that from chapter 3. Really what he's saying in verse 7 is, who does make you to differ one from another? In other words, if you are different, if one man has got a greater gift or one man is more compassionate, one man is a better shepherd, one man is a, a more precise uh, Bible teacher, he can uh, expose the word of God and teach it clearly. Well, he says, who gave you that key differentiating factor? Who gave you that skill and ability? Well, he said, what do you have that you did not receive? He's really saying anything we've got, we got from God. God gifted us, God enabled us, God gave us opportunities. So he says, what have you got that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, then why do you glory as if you had not? In other words, he's saying, if you think it was just you and it's all your qualities and it's your skills and your ability and yourself, then he said, I think you need to think again because the ability that you have is a God-given ability, a spirit-given ability. And if you received it, it was a gift and you should be grateful and you shouldn't be proud about what you have. Then he goes on to say in verse number eight, now you are full, now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we also might reign with you. I think what he's saying here is that you're acting as people um, who are actually living in the, the easiest of circumstances. You're acting as if 
Christ has already come, that his authority is now accepted in the world, that he's reigning as king. And he says, you are rich, you are full, you're satiated, your, your life is satisfied and full, and you reign as kings without us. And he says, I really wish that I did reign with you. He says, I really wish that's the stage we were at, but we're not. And he's going to go on to explain to them that maybe God is using the apostles as an extreme example and a spectacle so that they might understand that Christian life is not an easy passage. He says in verse 9, For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, unto angels, unto men. So he's saying that really God is making an example of us. Uh, God has exhibited us as the kind of example. Uh, it's almost as if we've been brought out into the theatre and we've been made a spectacle. And he says men in the world can see us, the world at large, the whole universe, the angelic beings and mankind can all observe that we actually seem to be doomed to death. <laughs> well, Paul, he's going to go and expand on that. But you would read through the book of Acts and you would understand that Paul indeed faced death many, many times. You see, let me, I'll come back to the intervening verses, but if you read with me, he says in verse 11, even unto this present hour, we hunger, we thirst, we're naked, we're brutally treated, we're buffeted, we have no certain dwelling, we wander without a home, we labour, we work with our own hands, we're mocked, we're reviled, we bless, we're persecuted, we're suffering, enduring it, we're being insulted and defamed, uh, we're made as the filth of the world. What he's saying is, we're actually not having the success that you're talking about. We're not living in the lap of luxury. We're not enjoying the ease of life. We're actually going through difficult times because we're seeking to teach and preach the word of God and it's not a popular thing to do. So you see the contrast. He says, you're reigning as kings. I wish it was so. I wish I was there doing it with you. But actually we look as if we've been earmarked and we're in the theatre, we're exposed, we're made a spectacle. We're actually going through the opposite, suffering and difficulty. And in verse 10 he says, in fact, we are fools for Christ's sake. But you're wise. Maybe a little tongue-in-cheek there, maybe slight sarcasm. He's saying, we're the fools for Christ, but you're wise. We're weak, you're strong, you're honourable, we're despised. Well, looking back to the course of history, you would have to say, well, where does the honour lie? The honour lies in the hands of the men like Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Silas and all these people that suffered for the faith. Men in previous generations like Tyndale and Wycliffe and men like them who withstood the opposition and persecution of men to preserve the word of God and present it to us. The suffering saints are a picture of those that are walking with God as opposed to those who live in an easy, easy circumstance in their life. Now when we get to verse 14, Paul says, I'm not writing these things to shame you, but I'm writing to warn you. And he says, I love you. You're my beloved sons, my beloved children. He says, I'm writing to not to shame you, but to warn you. Don't get sucked into thinking this popularity type of gospel. Everything's easy. Everything's smooth. No, there's no problems. He says, I'm warning you as my children. I love you. And he says, you might have 10,000 instructors. He's using the kind of the argument of exaggeration. He's saying you might have 10,000 instructors, 10,000 guides or tutors or teachers. But he says, you've not many fathers. Now, there's a very important lesson. It may be easy enough to be a teacher and to instruct and to tutor and to tell people right from wrong. But where's the compassion in our heart? Where's the love? Where's the fatherly attitude that would even pull up short those who are doing wrong that would warn them that would risk un to be unpopular to make sure that people know the truth Paul says you might have many instructors but not so many fathers but he says in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel Paul wants them to understand that he went through the pains of childbirth to bring them to Christ to bring them into the glad tidings he's not going to let go of them now He's not going to leave them just to float. He's not going to leave them to get into false things. He wants them to walk with God and he's going to do everything possible to ensure that is the case. May we, who teach God's word, have that attitude, not just to be an instructor, but to actually be uh, a father as well. And may we, who are being fathered and cared for, receive that advice and guidance in the same spirit. May God bless his word to us today. Thanks for watching this.